I'm here with Roger Magoulis, Director of Research at O'Reilly Media and Co-Chair of O'Reilly Strata Conferences. Hi Roger, how are you? Good, how are you Laurie? I'm doing well. Good. So what's on your mind today about data? Well, there's so much going on between the data management side and analytics and stuff that's really incredible. But what's been happening is as I do our analysis is that I start thinking about are we asking the right questions and what what don't we know? And it started me thinking about social science as perhaps fitting into part of the puzzle. When you, you find something out, you're like, why does this happen? Data often can't explain it. And what I think you start needing to do is talking to people, using the techniques from ethnography and anthropology to gather information, try to make some sense of it, and then, in a kind of a cycle, maybe have that feed into new instruments to to detect data. So I can actually give you an example. Okay, great. We have our Velocity Conference that attracts people who are interested in keeping high volume data sites up and running. You would think retailers would be interested in this topic. Did some analysis and not many retailers were showing up. These would be the rest of the crowd. But we did find a few retailers and we sat them down, asked the kind of open-ended questions that an anthropologist would ask, and learned like two pretty significant things. One is they thought that some of the retailers were intimidated by the technology at uh, Velocity. The other is that did we know the cycle of a typical retailer technology person and that they were in lockdown sometime in the summer up until the end of Christmas because that's their big season. Mm -hmm. So many retailers get so much of their revenue there. Now we have a Velocity in, in October and if we had done a big marketing campaign to retailers and no one came, we would have thought we did a bad campaign. We wouldn't have known that it was likely a, just a structural thing in the retail business. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of thing that um, gives us insights. Now, it doesn't mean talking to people you learned everything, but now right. you've got new things to So how often do you think we're making the wrong conclusions just by looking at the data, by looking at sales data, or looking at any sort of demographic data? When it, when, are, when do we know whether those are the right conclusions? Well, I don't, it, it's funny because you really don't know. There's still a lot of art to this. Mm -hmm. But as, as you look into it, you're likely downstream. Like you probably won't know right away that you made the wrong thing, but things will start coalescing where something isn't working the way you expected. And then in hindsight, you might say, oh, there's something wrong. I can give you another, it's kind of an older example from us is, a few years ago, I was asked about doing a VMware book. Mm -hmm. And I looked at the analysis, and I, it was a late Friday. I sent a quick email off to the editor and just gave him the figures, the numbers. This is how many VMware books. It was not very big. And this is before the explosion in right, cloud right. and so forth. And the next morning, I woke up in like a cold sweat. I'm like, what if they make a decision based on those numbers? So then I wrote this big, long like essay saying, who's the author? Are the other authors well known in the space? Um, what's going on at VMware? Would VMware work with us to do this? Um, what's just going on generally in technology where, where VMware at the time they were about to kind of explode? Mm -hmm. um, it's that kind of thing where if you just acted on the numbers, you probably would have had a wrong right. conclusion. And how would you have known is that this is what makes it hard is what if you didn't publish a book because of that? There would be no evidence. Right. There, there's nothing to detect. Except that a little while later, you might notice that VMware books are up and we're not participating. Mm -hmm. That we didn't make that. That's right. That, that so that's what I mean about it takes, it often takes some time to figure out um, those so, mistakes. So it's sort of the danger that you fear that you're looking at data, and even though you're trying to predict the future with that data, that you're looking in the rear view mirror. Yes. So does what you're talking about with, with um, bringing in anthropology help you predict the future better? So I think so. And predicting the future is such a, you know, it's such a tough thing. What I think it does is it gives you some understanding of how to th think about what's going on. If you were really good about predicting the future, you'd probably be a deity. And, mm -hmm. and so it's um, just giving you the inputs that you're not blind. If you think about the context of working in the book industry like we do, there's certain things that we just know, right, because mm -hmm. we've been there. And but when you're talking to the people who read the books and come to our conferences, you're not in their world. And the more that you can understand about that, 
it's just, that means you can instrument better. So you're just more likely to have a probability of what you're predicting making some sense and to understand it in its right context. Mm -hmm. So that when you see a number, you don't just say, oh, it's 12, I should do this. But right. say 12, okay, well, let me think about what's going on mm -hmm. and, and then hopefully making that you know, appropriate moves as a result. So how do you think people should approach this? We got all sorts of data coming from us everywhere. We're being constantly told you need to make data-driven decisions for right. your business. How do we do that? Well, I think one of the things is remember that data isn't knowledge. So if you can kind of keep that in mind, data is an input. Data doesn't make a decision for you. Data is an input to a decision. If you can focus on the understanding and have the data in the service of that, I think that's really how a good quantitative organization works. It's not that they have the best um, support vector machine, mm -hmm. random forest operators. It's that they can kind of ask the right questions. They're always learning. And they're in whatever client, customer, whatever, whatever they're trying to do, that they can relate to them. And that as the data comes in, it makes some sense because you know this kind of meta information or this deeper understanding. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, and if you've read any of the Dan Kahneman or Dan Ariely books about behavioral economics, we're pretty irrational. So when you're getting rational numbers against our kind of irrational right. behavior. We have our own prejudices, we have our own uh, uh, There's some things where I won't right. buy certain things. There is no good reason. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes think that American Express must, can't believe that I don't buy an American Express <laughs> car because <laughs> of the big package, because all the demographics would be that I should want one, but I'm just not going to get one. Mm -hmm. And so just knowing that, like if someone were to ask me my emotional opinion of that, they'd find that it's an incentive won't work, and it's not even worth those, they send those luxury, I don't mean to pick on American right, Express, right. but. Um, There's a lot of factors that go that's, into that's any, right. any person's decision. That's right. And so how do you detect emotion? Well, I don't think numbers, they help you know that there might be issues around it. And I think without that input, it, it's kind of almost a paradox. Mm -hmm. To be a good quantitative organization, you need good qualitative information okay. to make the numbers make sense. That's, that's a great point. So you talked about some interesting resources um, on the social side. So what are some other resources that people can tap? Well, the, there's the, it's obviously social media. Mm -hmm. And I think I'll um, give a little specific with social media. There's this kind of notion of who you are in social media. And social media has become like a space. Now, not everyone does it. My parents don't do it very mm -hmm. much. And, but for people who are into it, there's this kind of continuum of personality. And it's known as the perceived self, or the prescribed self, and the elastic self. And the perceived self is your name, who you are, where you live, the stuff that you would tell your friends. Right. The elastic self is who you want to be. It's your performative, uh, dynamic, crazy part. And maybe you don't want your close friends to know that part of you. And there's anonymous places. So just knowing how people use the different media will give you a lot of insight into how you might extract the kind of group aggregate data, so not about a particular person, but like how certain groups are acting by knowing that people on Tumblr or Reddit are acting very different than someone on Facebook, mm -hmm. where their, right, their right, name right. And, and all their stuff mm -hmm. is there. So as you gain some understanding of that, then the data you get makes more sense. The other thing is we're a long way from figuring out what a Facebook like means or what a Twitter retweet right. means. We think we know, or people act as though we know. And we think we know the type of people that are going to those sites and that they're different. You That's know, right. I would describe a Reddit person much different than I would describe someone who's on Facebook. That's right. And in fact, you can derive some of those differences by looking at if there's text, you can do text analysis and so forth. So you can like add to this picture. So I think it augments what you might find out. Because I mean, the weakness with the social science stuff is you can only talk to so many people. And you also have the biases of who will talk to you, right? There's right. plenty of people who you know, won't talk to you. And then the over-reliance on, on surveys and focus groups. Um, when I say over-reliance, it implies that they're negative, but what they don't get out is what like a, a real 
if you could afford it, like real ethnography mm -hmm. I mean, is really valuable. There was a recent article in The Atlantic where people were open up their houses for eight hours. An ethnographer spends eight hours in their house watching everything they do. Wow. And they're talking about why did you do that? Why did you put the cookies up high? You know, why did you get a water now? Yeah. You know, what do you think? Why about? did you call for pizza tonight That's or right. whatever? Right. That's right. Well, it's obviously a very expensive data gathering, and because the sample sizes are small, it requires a good ethnographer to interpret that uh, efficiently so that you can move stuff. And since it's relatively expensive, and some of the quantitative stuff is cheap, you can get right. the get that kind of imbalance. So what people need to know is they need to combine both. You need to be thinking about yeah, absolutely. what people are uh, doing based on the data and how that's impacted by their emotions. Uh, yeah, I've got a little chart, that's so two circles, you know, quant and qual, and that there's questions coming from here, understanding goes back, there's questions coming from here, and understanding coming back. So Great. it's like, and I'll just end with, it never ends because it's dynamic. Right? Everything you do creates a change in the context. You, that means you need to go back and see how that worked. So it never ends. Great advice, Roger. Well, thank you.